It is definitely beginning to look a lot like Christmas here in New York, and I think there in Omaha as well. Uh, before we get into everything, as always, guys, we have great sponsors who are keeping us doing what we do. I actually have a mellow pack in the mail from Ned. I'm excited to try uh, what they have in store. They have so many new products on the horizon, and it's just been exciting watching them grow. Uh, you know, it all started with the CBD oil, the full spectrum hemp, and CBD has become extremely popular. I would say in the past few years at this point, making it more and more difficult to navigate and choose the right company and product. That's where Ned comes in. They produce the highest quality full spectrum CBD extracted from organically grown hemp plants, all sourced from an independent farm in Peonia, Colorado. Ned is a wellness brand offering science-backed and nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. And uh, I mean, you've seen it as well, Chris, guys who are you know, slowly getting off meds. And I'm not saying you could do that cold turkey yeah. and switching over to something that's all natural and good for them. And, yeah. and it, yeah, just, it, it works. You just have to be patient with it. You know, you have to let it get into your system. Um, and it took me, I think really two, three weeks till I didn't start seeing it. My, my wife started seeing the difference mm -hmm. and, and just saw, you know, I laughed a little bit, little level out where it, it didn't make me drowsy or, or slow or sluggish or anything like that. Like you said, it, it doesn't have that high effect. It just levels you out, man. It makes you where you're, and in my case, just not as angry, you know, I, and didn't fly off the handle as, as much as I, I had in the past. So yeah, tremendous stuff. Actually, I just got a new order in. I just had to redo my order and, and I got it in and I'm, I haven't tried the sleep blend yet, but they sent me a sample. So I'm going to give a shot, that a shot, but I'm sold on the immunity blend and the CBD and it, it works. And it, it's, it honestly, I, it keeps me healthy. I take a drink of the uh, immunity blend after a workout. I'll put in some water. I'll dilute it and I'll put in some water and, and drink it. And, you, you know, you just feel 10 times better. And, and so I highly recommend it. And then also because the guys are from Paonia, Western Colorado, where I grew up, salt of the earth. That's where my grandfather's farm was. So, yeah, I know that I know they have good fields and they have good soil and good things that go into this product, which make it honestly, to me, the best CBD oil on the market for, for people to take and for veterans, highly recommend it. Yeah, they're great. And we couldn't recommend them more highly. So if you want to check out Ned and try their CBD for yourself or anything, their sleep blend, we have a special offer for the podcast audience. Go to helloned.com slash battle line, or you can just enter battle line at checkout for 15% off your first one-time order or 20% off your first subscription order plus free shipping. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash battle line to get 15% off your first one-time order or 20% off your first um, subscription order plus free shipping. Thank you, Ned. And uh, as always, Fort Scott Munitions is absolutely killing it. Fort Scott is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition that is designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition, their, their trademark, outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you're going to receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states. But if you want to get our discount, you got to order online. It's fortscottmunitions.com, F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com. Go there now. Enter the exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and this podcast. And uh, we'll do some Christmas music here for a change. Let's hit it.
The switch is on, but I feel like it's a different switch this episode because it's Christmas time. So maybe the uh, the switch on the Christmas lights on the tree. <laughs> not, not, not the aggressive switch. <laughs> that's, that's funny. I like that, man. Sorry, you're, you're cracking me up. You're, you're, you're killing me. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's a uh, battle line Christmas Christmas extravaganza. This is the uh, final episode before uh, you know the celebrations, and you're off to Disney with the family. And uh, yeah. Hope that you guys are enjoying. I know that, of course, you know, we always say there's some people out there who are either stationed overseas or or even the healthcare workers, EMTs, who are working, you know, around the clock. So we salute all you guys as well. Truck yeah. drivers. Yeah, out there on the road. Uh, yeah, and, and you see even, even all those, the retail workers that are out there having to deal with what's going on. And I still have a lot of respect for them because even uh, when, when this hibbity-bibbity virus thing hit and they still were out there having the store stocked. I mean, they don't, they don't get the recognition they deserve. I mean, we, we give them the first responders. We, you know, and, and like truck drivers, perfect. We don't, they don't get the recognition they deserve because when all that craziness went on and the toilet paper was flying off the shelves, I mean, that was, that was a severe panic where things weren't, weren't, where we're like, Oh my gosh, are we not going to have all the basic necessities that we need? Cause obviously we, we don't farm and, and hunt and kill our own our own game anymore for freeze at least a lot of us out there don't yeah most of us and, and uh and they they kept it going they kept working they 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 dealt with and they dealt with the attitudes that people have and they still do and it's amazing like my local target here down in north omaha i love those people over there and they're still every day just grinding along working and and making sure people have what they need so there wasn't a really a true legitimate total panic because there was no food on the shelves which of course yeah i mean i mean it was honestly to my opinion looking back you know we're that close to, to something like that happen where that could have been just complete chaos which i've seen in iraq and afghanistan which that does get pretty dang ugly so um hats off to you guys out there and, and uh, we all said on the truck drivers they don't get the respect they deserve as well especially oh yeah and, and i know a lot of podcast listeners are truck drivers because if you're on the road hours on end yeah you kind of want to listen to something <laughs> yeah. you know and, and yeah. sometimes it's music sometimes it's it's podcasts sometimes it's like three hour you know podcast marathons so it, it is it keeps you awake actually i can't listen to music when i'm driving on the road it, it puts me to sleep i have to listen to a voice you whether it's, it's like megadeth even no no I can put on Five Finger and Megadeth and Slipknot and 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 Mudvayne and and I'm still just oh, starting to crash out. Um, I have to put on either podcasts or 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 a comedy. Comedy keeps me awake. Where you you get on um, Larry the Cable Guy's Comedy Roundup, or is that Jeff Foxworth the Comedy Roundup, or Kevin Hart's Comedy Roundup, or Netflix is a joke, and and I have to listen to that because that's what keeps me awake. Because I I don't know for some reason it just I just start going oh, and start zoning out. <laughs> well. Speaking of metal, I did want to mention this because I told you uh, when we were on the phone yesterday, I really have to give a shout out because two guys from the band have been on the show to uh, Frankie from Amur because I've, I've always loved them. And uh, I was wearing my Amur sweatshirt from like five album cycles ago in 2011, uh, which I'm in the music video for Solar Flare Homicide from that video. We're for like, point, that. For like 0.5 seconds. We'll see me. <laughs> um, but uh, so I was wearing it and I just texted Frankie and I said, yeah, I'm still rocking this sweatshirt. And he goes, dude, I got to get you hooked up with some new gear. And uh, I figured he was going to send me a T-shirt or something. But he sent me a hood. They're all really cool. I was wearing one yesterday. I sent me a hoodie, a really nice windbreaker, T-shirt, long sleeve shirt, a pair of gym shorts, like all with the Amir logo for the uh, Hindsight album, which is a great album. And I have a ton of respect for those guys. If, if you've never listened to the episodes I did with them, to the audience out there, um, to me, Frankie is just such a resilient guy. Um, you know, we talk about kind of the resilience of guys like Scott, Scott Guerin, which yeah, a whole, oh like a whole <laughs> other level, <of> <laughs> level we'll get to. It's, yeah. um, you know, and I wouldn't say it's on that level, and neither would he. But the fact that, you know, right out of high school basically started this band went through a million lineup changes next thing you know the entire band leaves and it's just him and he has to reform a whole new lineup um managed to still keep it moving and still keep the band successful and now just like every other band that's not on that metallica five finger death punch you know a uh, trivium type level they're uh, getting hit hard because venues are closing down uh mid-sized venues are closing down and that's how these guys make their money so um yeah, I can't say it enough. Go out and support bands. You know, streaming music doesn't really help them much. So if you could buy a physical copy, if you could buy shirts, because 
unfortunately, I think you're going to see a lot of these bands have to move on to do different things because that is their main source of income, unless they could do these live streams on Facebook, which some of them are doing um, and monetizing. But uh, yeah, everybody, you know, you don't hear about them enough because I think people think of the music industry as the Metallicas of the world and these guys who are millionaires. But the mid-level bands are definitely not millionaires. They're working class guys like like us. And, and they're awesome bands. I mean, they, their music, uh, we were just talking about it yesterday, David Silvera's yes. new band. As I, his album hasn't come out yet. Their new band's album hasn't come out yet because of, of you know, they're, they're the producers or I, I don't know, in the music business, you can maybe help me out on this, Ian, which, which do all the bookings because they're not able to book. They're not willing to put the money behind the album to, to get it out there because yeah. they can't recoup their money on the road, which is where I believe a lot of them recoup their money or even some of the bands make their money, which is on the road or Jimmy Allen's against all will uh, band as well. Those, the bands are, the, the bands are amazing. And they, I said, so Vera's new band helped me. I'm so good. Well, they were biased, but now their bias is an acronym for it's being in. I'm going to look it up because I do want to make sure I get it right. On yeah, help, help me out because I know they changed it. And I, yeah, David, I know if you're listening out to man, I'm sorry. Here we go. Breaking in a sequence. Break, so it, okay. bias stands for breaking in a sequence. And yeah, they're, they're fucking awesome. And I don't just say it because it's David. Like they, because David's been in some other bands that, uh, that honestly have been like, yeah, this is okay. Um, I agree with you. This new stuff I like better than the new corn stuff. It really is, yeah, yeah, it is. That's why it's like, oh my gosh, this is this is just as good, if not better, than Follow the Leader when corn, he came when corn came out with that, which I thought was an amazing album. Oh yeah, um, and, right. and you know, and, and Jimmy Allen's Against All Will. I mean, he's they're pretty much up there with Puddle of Mud. I, I think put yeah. Puddle of Mud, but there you can't hear them because there's no way to get them out right now, and and radio stations aren't going to play them because again, there's no way to promote. Because you can't get them on the road to to actually uh, actually show or market them and who they are. So yeah, and even if they do play them, it's just uh, you know I've heard like because I'm friends with Frankie more than you know these other guys we've had on, but he's he's said like yeah the music industry just has their hand in our pocket and that yeah they basically have moved on to this streaming platform. Which I also heard Phil from All That Remains say all that, yeah. that uh, but what Phil said was he's like I make about enough from Spotify to have a premium Spotify account. Like they basically pay them <laughs> fractions of a That's penny. True. So the thing is, the whole business model was all right. Well, you guys could get some free promotion out of that, and you could tour, and you could recoup that. But then if you can't tour, yeah. then how do you make money? And these guys who are smart guys like Phil Labonte, yeah. unfortunately, it's business. And and if they aren't seeing support, they're probably going to move on to different things. And I would hate to see that happen, but it's just the reality because, it, the like I said, these venues are closing. And I heard Eddie Trunk say it, actually. I think these bigger tier bands like Slipknot and, and Metallica are going to have to step up and find a way to support these mid-level bands that yeah. open for them, whether it's, uh, Eddie said it on the radio yesterday, and I thought it was a good point. He said, if a band like Aerosmith could do a charity gig at one of these small venues and pay like, and charge, and he said people will pay it, like $1,000 a ticket in a really small seating venue, and just give that money to keep that venue open or keep these mid-level bands going. I'd love to see something like that. Yeah, it, it'd be. It, it's uh, you gotta, you gotta. I, it's easy for us to say because we're not in the. At least for me, say yeah, they should do that because I'm not in the music business. I don't know everything that goes on behind it, but yeah, I, I, I agree because of of the background that that I have within the military. Sometimes you have to give a little bit of yourself, and even in the realm I'm in right now, which is. Uh, yeah, I, it, don't say influencer. I, I'll punch you in the face. <laughs> but the, the public figure world where, yeah, people, hey, could you donate this for we got a good cause? Can you donate this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you do. You're like, okay, yeah. What do, what do you need? Um, I think that's where you need to be. Like, hey, yeah. What do you guys need to keep it going? We have an auditorium here called Sokol Auditorium, which is where 311 started. You know, so 311. Oh, yeah, that's right. from Omaha. Yeah, 311 is an Omaha band. And they've had Slipknot come down to it when they were small. It's, it's one of those original venues where you could get the mosh pits going. I mean, one of those small teeny places that's famous in Omaha because of the bands that started there. And that would be, a, you know, SoCal Auditorium would be a, go, a cool place for something like that to happen. So the question is, are they still staying open? Do you that's at, that I don't. And I, I, to be honest with you right now, I, I they were closed down for, a, they were closed down. All, yeah, all yeah. Them, but like, I don't know if they've reopened yet. You. Well, I would assume not, but I'm just wondering if they'll be able to reopen, um, you know, because there you really can't have concerts, but like Revolution in Amityville by me, which 
uh, Amir plays at. I've seen Orgy there. I've seen, and by the way, for those listening, not an Orgy. You see, for Monday. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, what did you, I was actually because like, what I the hell? I, I think we went off subject there, brother. Uh, <laughs> what, what's what's this place called? <laughs> um, who else have I seen? I mean, I've seen a ton of great bands there, but either way, you know, closed. They couldn't survive this, and there's going to be a ton of other venues that can't survive it. So, um, yeah, I mean. Not to be a downer, I'm just hoping things uh, can get back to normal and these venues can persist. Um, with that, man, yeah, Christmas, like I said, it's actually really nice to see it kind of snow this time of year here because I'm used to it happening in February when you're kind of over it. And this is the first, I guess you'd say, white Christmas in uh, in years in New York. Yeah, it's snow out here too, but that's pretty typical for Omaha. We got it really late. Uh, so Omaha's, this winter has been pretty mild and even the snow that's coming around it's been cold outside you know it's below freezing but we haven't got the wind so to be honest with you it's even been a mild cold <laughs> as well in comparison to what we usually get out here so we got snow on the ground but it's 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 honestly comfortable and I, i'm still getting out and running in it um the wind just that that takes it all out of you so i have to say it's been pretty pleasant so far and it's been good to see that people and i did a post on this on instagram about people getting their lights up early yeah to me that was a step in the right direction of people okay you know i'm sick and tired of being negative let's let's do something positive and it, it's right after thanksgiving it, people's lights and stuff went up which is earlier than normal which was nice to see so having a good nice snow out there it's not the mind numbing minus six wind chill out okay. there um it's been pretty pleasant it's been nice to see people at least majority of people that I see in my neighborhood take a positive step and put something up, which is lights in Christmas and have that Christmas spirit so early because I think a lot of people needed it. So yeah, it's people, people generally can fight through adversity if they want to fight through it. And, and that was just a step. I said, man, that's a good step in the right direction of fighting the adversity, bringing Christmas spirit in a lot earlier than most do. So that's yeah, nice to see, brother. I don't know how it is in your, when your neck of the woods, but out here was it was it was pretty pleasant. Yeah, I, w I would say the same thing here. Um, hey, before we get to Scott, I also wanted to mention before um, you know, because I've been meaning to bring it up actually, is the updates with Tonto's Gear Locker that <laughs> you go to ChrisTontoPronto.com. You could buy your book, any of your books, along with three different authors we've had on the show. This is really cool that you started this for people to check out. Well, I, you know, book, good books and, and good stories about adversity, real stories, uh, real life stories, I think, are motivating. That's what motivated me when I was younger was reading guys that were in Vietnam or uh, what's another good book that I, I, I read? Um, some of the books, actually, I read The Kite Runner when it first, now I wasn't super young at the time, but when that came out and real stories about real people, whether it was this country or another country and and um, a real instance in it, it just showed, man, people have, have that intestinal fortitude and I can do that. You know, that's the thing is, man, I know they, they fought through. I can do that. That, that can, that, so it motivated me. And having them on the show and hearing that they are real genuine people, whether it was Gunny Bustler or St. Nick, uh, you know, uh, John Castle or or uh, uh, Maria. Uh, uh, Julia Mackey. Julia. What am I saying? Maria. Sorry, Julia. She's my friend, too. Julia, <laughs> Julia Mackey on. And there are things that they went through. It, it, to me, is again, it's great to read because you're like, man, that's amazing. But then after you're done, like, you know, I can do that. I, I, I'm that strong. I can overcome stuff. If they can do it, I can do it. It's not a knock on them. It's just, hey, this is, I, I know I can be that strong and deal with adversity. And that person went through that heartache or that hardship there and they got through it. I can get through my day. And that's how I saw it. And that's why I think those books are on this. We, I put them on the Tano's Gear Locker was because of they are books about overcoming adversity and sometimes a lot of adversity and they have faith involved with it too which i think is important right now I, people don't you know we talk about god on the show and we're not ashamed to talk about god and faith on the show and that needs to come back in people's lives as well so yeah check them out they're fantastic books and then if you want a snippet of if you're not sure listen to the the podcast where they're on our podcast and then like then maybe that'll help you decide if you want to grab one or not and don't think about you have to get it on my site go to their sites and buy it uh, buy it uh standalone that's as long as People are reading those things, then, and reading the books. I, th I think uh, I think you're you're helping yourself as far as overcoming maybe the problems that you may be having in your life at this time or sometime in the future. So definitely, brother. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. 
No, it's right. But the incentive to go to your site is they get it signed. Which well, they get signed. Yeah, they're, they're, all the books are signed, definitely. And, and of course, the books I have, I always sign. And I put actually way too much in. <laughs> I, I, I I sign a lot. Or you can sit down. Actually, hey, I could attest to that, man. <laughs> Unless I felt like I was special because I know you. But I have. Uh, no, you have something special in there. I mean, yours is that's, more. That's yeah, in depth. yeah it's a, I'll take if it's my book, I'll take off the whole page. If it's 13 hours, I'll only take half of it because I want to make sure if you see Tig or Oz or Boone, they can It'll sign it. Bad Mitchell, motherfucker. Yeah, Mitchell, <laughs> Mitchell Zukoff, he can sign it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and the read where that came from, I know we're getting into it, but where it came from is I remember as a young kid, Arnold Palmer, tremendous, tremendous uh, athlete, tremendous just yeah, role model as a as a professional athlete, and he was, and he was a tremendous person as well, at least on, at least from what you saw from, you know, ES, I wasn't ESPN at the time, but CBS sports and, and, um, but when he would sign books, I remember, uh, there was a story that was told to me by my father. So yeah, I was signing books and, and, uh, there, he was with a young golfer that was, had a book out too. And Arnold was past his prime, but he was signing one of his books and the young author was just signing it. And, you know, it was, it was like a, uh, like a just passing it on. Now here, sign it, get out, sign it, get out. And I remember that said Arnold sat there, and he I said I saw the old guy. I saw Arnold say to the young guy, "Hey, uh, you know these people stand in line for hours to meet you. At least give them a couple minutes of your time, you know, and write something meaningful in their book." And that's always stuck with me. That's why when I do sign something, unless somebody says just put your name in it, yeah. I'm going to put something in there. And I do have quotes that I always live by, and that's the never quit, the Rangers lead the way. And then that's always in there. And then also I'll put John 15, 13, or if it's a veteran or if, or if somebody wants that in there. But again, if it's a friend, I always put something in there because hey, you're buying a book, you, you expect something in there, not just a signature. And I, that came from Arnold Palmer. That came from my dad telling me that story. And and I respected, that was a guy I respect, you know, the golf days, I did. My dad's a golfer, I golfed poorly. My dad and my brother were very good. And honestly, those kind of role models, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, you know, those guys as sports role models, I think were, you know, I don't think you're gonna see guys like that anymore. You, know, you, you don't see those professional professional guys that continue to win, but won, won with class. You know, you don't see that too much anymore. So I, I that's where it comes from. That's why I wrote right in there. Um, I hope I didn't write. Did I write something nasty? Sometimes if it's a friend of mine, I will <laughs> no, write something no. nasty. In there. But they ask, hey, could you write this? Yeah. Sure. No, it was. I remember it was special. So, yeah. 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 So thanks, man. Yeah. But but please, yeah, check out Tom's Gear Locker. And thank you for all you people out there that ask for a lot of this stuff that is on there now. Because if you didn't, I mean, that's that's you. That's your venture. I never thought about doing e-commerce ever. I was like, no, wait, no, no, no. I'm not into that. I'm not into that. So many requests. Hey. What about a gun? Magazines, books, T-shirts, so forth. I'm like, all right, well, let's do it. And it just kind of exploded. And that's from the people out there that requested it. Because uh, to me, I'm still humbled that anybody would want something with my name on it. I wouldn't buy something with my name. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I, it's, and it's, I think a it's slick amazing. Looking, yeah, it's a slick looking website, too. I was really impressed with. So Thanks, brother. Chris tontoperanto.com everything is on there we do have to get to scott gear yep. so before we do we haven't talked about them in a while and they've been up to some awesome stuff hero soap company hero soap company.com uh no chemicals dyes or fragrances in their product no parabens that are found in common soaps that link to breast cancer and reproductive complications in men now they just launched a new body wash in three different scents lavender the pines and the meadow but the meadow is already sold out. So they're going quickly. Get on it right now. They all include natural ingredients that your skin craves to stay hydrated, like olive oil, essential oils, and aloe vera. Uh, as we know with Luke, veteran-owned and focused on veteran charities, which includes the charity you founded, 14th Hour Foundation, who they donate to. And um, for the soap, not the body wash, they do the subscription purchase which they match the amount of soap that you buy and they send that same amount overseas to a deployed location. With the subscription, it's shipped straight to your door every month. So no worry of running out. Dudes always run out of their products before buying new or more um, and no contract with that. Cancel at any time. Let freedom clean. I love their stuff. You've heard me talk them up and I know you do as well. And I just ordered, you know, I, I just got my new order of my seven bars in that I, and I love, I love them all. And I love the pot, the pine smell. 
it yep. just always brings me back. And I'm just finishing up. I just started my my uh, cool mint. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that feeling within your nether regions, man. My taint, <laughs> my taint never felt so clean, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very wintry for this. Season. Very wintry. Great, but great stuff. And the soap lasts forever. I mean, it, it, one bar lasts, lasts just as long as three bars when I used to use Irish Spring. I mean, it does. So, so you, you, it's worth it. It's worth the cost, and and it, it it's great stuff. And for what they do, it's fantastic. So, yeah, I, I support Hero Soap definitely, and will continue to buy their products and continue to 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 push their their products because I think it's I think it's some of the best stuff out there, and it does make you feel good in the shower. It does. It really does. All you veterans, it's going to bring back memories. I'm telling you what, it's going to. Yeah. And especially this time of year um, with the winter, it won't dry you out. Uh, you guys will love it. HeroSoapCompany.com and use our offer code BATTLELINE for 15% off. And then you could even combine that with the subscription for 10% off on the hard soap. So it's BATTLELINE. Use that code at HeroSoapCompany.com. Once again, Fort Scott Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. This ammunition was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design. It was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters alike. With the ammunition being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as direct online through fortscottmunitions.com. Use our exclusive promo code BATTLELINE for 15% off your order. Only available to listeners of the BATTLELINE podcast, Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the Battle Line Podcast. Joining us for the first time on Battle Line Podcast, tremendous individual, Scott Gearn, Air Force PJ, who survived an absolutely horrific parachute accident from 3,500 feet in the air, not only lived to tell about it, but then also went on to re-enlist yeah. with the Air Force PJs after an 18-month recovery period, was a part of Operation Eager Anvil in Iraq during the time of Desert Storm, um, and went on to do a lot with U.S. Special Operations in Europe. Your story is actually documented in Chris's book, The Patriot's Creed. And uh, for the audience, there's a little bit of a delay here. Just bear with us, but an honor to have you on, man. Hey, it's my honor, and I'm great to be here with both of you guys. It's my honor. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Scotty. Thanks again, and thanks for the the part of the being part of the book too man i appreciate that your people have on your chapter in the patriots creed just unbelievable and i know i know when 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 i was going through the the paperwork going through all the all the recordings and stuff you had with melissa i was like oh my gosh this is this unbelievable burning in and then seeing the light coming back and then finding a way to re-enlist and, and be a PJ again. Because, I, you know, I, we knock PJs and, and CCTs, all the guys in the SOCOM, you know, SEALs and Rangers, so forth. But when it comes right down to it, brass tacks, we have to admit that C CTs and PJs have the hardest in dock out of all of ours. I, I admit it. I ain't going to lie. I'm, I'm found they, it was it's the hardest vetting to get into with the combat controllers and pararescue. So, brother, uh Man, I'm proud of you, man, and, and you're you're one hard ass son of a bitch. So, man, much respect to you, brother. Well, I I appreciate that very much. I, uh, all of the whole gang across the uh, spectrum that we all work together and work with. That uh, none of it's easy to do, and certainly it takes a, a special mindset and a special person to do it. And I'm. Uh, just glad that I'm able to work with uh, the caliber of people that I've been able to all my uh, military career and, and afterwards. And um, definitely rain, working with the Rangers, the operations, the airfield seizures, when uh, landing on the airfield yeah. is the safest place with always uh, <laughs> interesting jumps. <laughs> 
That's awesome. Yeah, you know what would be a, a great place to start this, I think, Scott, is uh, just your story of enlisting. What made you want to be in the Air Force? What made you want to do things like jumping out of planes? Because it takes a pretty uh, skilled and ballsy individual to, <laughs> to do that. Well, you know, maybe maybe you can add crazy, a little crazy in there as well for most of the guys that do that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I know early on before I had joined the military, I kind of had that urge to jump off of things. You know, I rode my sister's bicycle off of the roof of the house one time when I was a kid. She wasn't happy because her bicycle didn't survive <laughs> that. But I just always had that urge to to jump off of things. It was a feeling. I didn't want to commit suicide and jump off buildings, but when I was up high like that, I wanted to. I wanted to fly. I wanted to jump. Then uh, later, you know, I used to go out to uh, Upper Hills in Florida next to Tampa and see the skydivers out there, and it was always something I wanted to do. And and after high school of uh, uh, goofing off a little bit in junior college, some uh, uh, friend of mine decided to, uh, he and I decided to go see a recruiter, talk to the Air Force recruiter, found out about pararescue as an option. And then I could jump out of airplanes. He said, hey, I don't know anything about it other than when you see your Air Force recruiter and tell him what you want to do, it's not guaranteed. When you get to Lackland, you, if you're lucky enough to see one of the pararescue instructors, drop down in front of him and do 100 push-ups, and you'll be a PJ. I thought, well, man, I can do that. I can do 100 push-ups. So that, that's how it started. Okay, now, good question, and we'll get into what happened to you. I, I do want to talk about a little bit with, with your jump in, because, again, I still think it's remarkable, and I want to know about when you explained you saw the light, because as much as we do cuss on this show, this is a faith-based show, brother, and I do I do want to hear about how you saw the light, but once you were, once all that happened, again, we'll get into that, but what made you want to, and I still, I'm still trying to fathom that, what made you want to do it again? And we talked about it in the book, but I, I do want to hear it from from uh, from uh, you know the horse's mouth per se. Uh, why in the world did you say you know I need to get back in and fight a way to to, to rejoin and reenlist? Because uh, I've reenlisted to go back to the Rangers before without an injury. So, uh, bro, I I think that's amazing that you wanted to do it again. Can you can you expound on that a little bit? What your thought process was? Uh, the thought process was I I loved my job. I didn't know of anything else at the time that I wanted to do other than be a PJ, a pararescue man. And the thought was also that I wanted to go out on my own. When it was time to stop jumping, to stop being a PJ, to retire, or whatever it was, I wanted to make that decision. I didn't want it made for me because of an accident. And I was able to, you know, stay one step ahead of the decision makers that would have initially. Uh, medically retired me right away, which was an option. I talked to the flight recruiter. He said, do you want to you want to be when I got back out of the hospital, the three months at Portsmouth Naval Hospital, I got back to uh, Fort Bragg, Pope Air Force Base, and I saw a uh, flight surgeon and he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I just want the chance to do my job again. If I can't do it, then we'll go from there. Um, and he said, OK. That's, that's on you. And I didn't see the flight surgeon again after that. He let me, uh, he, he would have started the paperwork to medically retire me. And, and he did. And he just said, okay, good luck. And being in JSOC at the time, <laughs> we were one step ahead of the Air Force system. And so once I went through that 18 months of uh, recovery and yeah. surg surgical procedures, um, I worked I had the plan and most ready to go when that happened when the doctor said okay you're as healed as much as you can be and we uh, I was with the uh, Craig Silverton orthopedic surgeon on our team I was also a PJ and he said let's do the uh, PT test and then we did the waiver for uh, to send to the surgeon general and um, it's amazing that I got a waiver because being unconscious is not something that is allowed on flight status, you know, at any time. And I was unconscious yeah. for different periods of time. And um, I was just uh, by the, you know, uh, 
grace of God and uh, tenacity to do it. I, I got a waiver to get back on status and uh, big stamp said on air crew status and uh, on as a pararescueman again. And uh, about two weeks later, uh, within the next month, I was I went I went straight to a, a TDY to Florida for a jump uh, training. <laughs> uh, that one was pretty scary getting Amazing. back that bit. That Amazing. No, it's just on the la it's just a lag. No, I you know with, with that and Scotty, I, if if you can, again, I, you, you, we wrote about you very well done. I, I think with with what you said, and because I basically wrote ver verbatim what you what you told. You know, what we did with Melissa and me going through our records and we interviewed you for the book. But um, some of our listeners don't know, and now we're jumping around it. And this is how we do it on the show. We don't we don't have a set plan. We jump everywhere. We're all over the place. So. Can you right, right. go into a little bit of what happened, if you don't mind, if uh, yeah, and just and go the down and dirty. You don't need to get into it because we want to talk about UFOs too. Because if you didn't know it, I'm a big UFO, <laughs> UFO paranormal guy. I, I want to talk about that as well. Oh yeah, we can we can go in that. So uh, give you with the uh, the parachute operation. You know, I was uh, stationed. I was assigned to the SEAL team in Virginia. Uh, we did a rotation up there for the alert package, and we were mm -hmm. we were allowed to train in the local area. Anything else we couldn't leave unless unless there was an alert that we were launched on, or such as say the Achille Lara, which was a long time ago. But um, so in the local area, we could do some training. And I get one of the things I always think of with this is you never know how the choices you make today will impact your tomorrows maybe it's the the next day or 25 or 30 or 40 years later or at some point in your life right so this all these chain of events have impacted me uh, in different ways but certainly to save my life so we were doing a team training you know how in a, in a in a group of individuals everybody has different skills and mine was the paramedic so the team i was with on Monday, on Tuesday, we were doing a train up. I was doing medical training for the team, how to stop the bleeding, traumatic bleeding, and how to open airways and emergency airways. And you know, we practiced with little yeah. pictures out of a, out of a anatomy book, and we'd put a, a pictures of a throat on a styrofoam cup, and we'd feel each other's throats, and then we'd make that landmark connection and what it looked like and we'd poke a little knife through the styrofoam cup just as we were simulating with somebody that needed an airway emergency airway and so this was on a tuesday mm -hmm. the next day we were doing our free fall training jump and i remember driving out to the uh the drop zone and stopping on the way getting coffee and donuts and stuff you know good health food and getting to the drop zone we jumped out of a marine uh, helicopter uh h uh 47 um and uh that's about where i my memory mm -hmm. uh conscious memory stops at that point until about three days later so we we jumped out of there we jumped out of the airplane we did our, our training our dirt dive on the ground and then we, we went up to thirteen thousand feet we jumped out, we were free falling, which I don't remember any of this. Uh, I can recount what happened based on eyewitnesses of what they saw and what they did. And so our plan was at 3,500 feet, based on our altimeters and how we were falling, we would deploy our parachutes, which is what I did. It was my 90th free fall. I was very comfortable in the air, I loved it. I'd been through. Air Force Academy jump school. I've been through the Army Special Forces free fall school and had about 50, uh, 60 more jumps somewhere in there, whatever equals to 90 that training schools and then um, out in the field. But I just felt comfortable. And so at 3,500 feet, uh, pulled my uh, parachute deployment handle, hope the parachute opened. And I'm sure at that point, lights went out for me because uh there was another jumper above me still in free fall and he saw my canopy open 
and he realized he couldn't avoid hitting me. He's balled up in a, a cannonball type position. And at that point, he's traveling in excess of 120 miles per hour, came through the canopy, uh, destroyed the canopy, knocked me unconscious. I'm sure, and then I went the rest of the way to the ground with a streamer parachute behind me. Uh, so about 3,000 feet estimated hit the ground at about 100 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, wow. The first uh, guys to me were uh, SEALs, Bobby uh, and David. Uh, they were under the under canopy and their own canopies, and they saw that I was having a problem. So they steered their parachutes and they landed uh, where I was, which was not a total wooded area, but a shrub, small tree area. And they, um, you know, got to me and I was unconscious, uh, on my back, uh, kind of convulsing. I was full of blood. I wasn't breathing. And so it was kind of, you know, the, the day prior, these guys had training on exactly what to do. And they maintained my neck stabilization. They poured me over. I remember Bobby saying, man, it looked like a gallon of blood poured out of your mouth. And then I started gasping. I knew I was still alive. And about that time, other guys start coming in. The other medic, the other uh, paramedic, paramedic, man, we were rotating our jumps. So I wouldn't have a, a medic on the drop zone, Larry Yakamoto. Uh, and those guys got in there. And so then they made a makeshift litter with a poncho and branches and like the helicopter didn't have a hoist. About the, it took about an hour to get me to an opening for a, actually a, a civilian life flight came in and picked me up and took me to uh, Portsmouth Naval Hospital. And I was in the ICU and that's, you know, that's when they cric did a cricothyroidotomy and other uh, procedures and the tubes and everything down my throat and and on my face and head and everything was swollen and and I couldn't talk couldn't see went into about uh, probably another 24 38 hours before I was kind of coming to I guess and I I I remember at that point um, I was afraid that I was blind and and I would never be able to do my job again. And somebody, uh, Mike, put a pencil or a pen in my hand and a pad of paper, and I wrote a question, am I blind? Kind of, it wasn't very neatly written. I still have those papers. And uh, the doctor said, no, you're not blind. And I remember that he pushed each eyelid up separately and shined a light in and said, can you see that? And I said, I kind of, yes. And uh, I don't even know how I said yes, but whatever it was, I, and then I, I wrote, maybe I wrote yes, I don't quite remember that. Then I wrote, because I couldn't move, I thought my neck was broken. I think, well, my neck's broken, I'm not going to be able to go back and do my job either. And I wrote, is my neck broken? And he said, no, your neck's not broken. And uh, after that point, it was just a feeling came over me. I, I knew that I was going to be all right. I was in the best care possible and that they were going to take care of me and I was going to get well and one day I was going to get to do my job again. So from the time I jumped driving to the flight lot for the drop zone to that point, I was in the unconscious, in and out of conscious state, but I have a very clear memory of, of a, of a near-death experience. Most people, like you said, a white light experience in there. And it's as clear today as it was, you know, in that time 40 years ago, not 40, 30 years ago. So I, I had the experience kind of started where I, I didn't know at the time I had been injured. I just knew something had happened. But I was, it was the most peaceful feeling you could ever imagine. It was, um, and I was surrounded by that that light, that white light. And I, I look at it now being surrounded, if you can imagine a 40 watt level light bulb and that's completely surrounded me. And I, I realized now that, that that was energy and it was love and it just made me feel, it was just such a great, great feeling. 
and I was I was moving. I knew I was leaving. I could see my body was damaged and had been injured, and I didn't know what it was, and it didn't even enter my mind. It was just like my mind, the conscious side of it was just the same as it was um, prior to the accident. Only I was not in my body, and I was I knew I was leaving it, and then over a cert over my shoulder area was a very very bright area like that hundred watt bulb area and i was going to that light it wasn't like a tunnel but it was just a very bright area and standing in front of the light were three figures and i i don't know who they were i didn't and we were telepathically kind of communicating they were welcoming me and i was I was going to them, but my consciousness, my soul was going to them. And I got almost to them and I was I was thinking, I'm gonna be able to see who this is now. And right on the edge of that, I heard the voices that it, it's time to go now. Very deep, very clear, very distinct, it's time to go now. And at that point, many thoughts went through my head and realized the choices that people have to, you know, just to, be their best to do good, what's going on in life, or whatever, all the different thoughts I had. And I I said, I'm not ready to go yet. And I turned my head away from the bright area. And that was the last thing I remember uh, during that time period. And then I, I kind of was coming to in the hospital and then just the procedures that carried on for the next uh, three months in the hospital and then the other surgeries over the next uh, 15 months until I was cleared for uh, jumping and being back here to the rest of me. So. Wow. That's why I say the transition. Yeah. That's, dude, that is amazing. And yeah, I, I know you wrote about it. I know we put it. Is it? <laughs> wow, man. Um, yeah, I, I, we, and we, we won't get, because I want to get into some other stuff. So does Ian. But uh, just all that and just amazing how you know that story because i i believe in that and i believe that that that's what happens i i do I, and um you know you 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 verify it for me which is amazing and, and the ability to make a choice say hey you know, i'm not ready to go and come back to your body knowing that you're going to go through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering to me is that's just intestinal fortitude that's courage brother and you, and you got it obviously you got it and then uh, and then the ability to go back in and, you know, with your throat, having the scar tissue because you have to hit and that we didn't even get into that. And again, I get we don't need to. We'll, we'll let we'll save that for people that want to read, read your story, which I, I want them to. But the stuff you went through just to get back in um, and, and you did it and you chose to do it. You, you, you turned away from the light, which to, is, to me, it just gives me chills. Yeah, that's that's freaking amazing. Um, yeah, Ian, you got anything, bro? I know I'm, I'm over talking to you again because I, I love Scott's no, it, story. It is, I think Scott's story is just incredible. For sure. No, and I know that we're limited on time because there's so much to talk about his career. And I would love to get into, you know, what you did in Europe, what you did during Desert Storm, and maybe we'll another time. Um, but I, I know, as Chris said, we want to get into your book that you wrote just recently hiding in plain sight, documenting UFOs with some photographic evidence. Where did this all begin? Did you have, I mean, beyond this paranormal experience, did you have a UFO encounter of some uh, sort? Actually, I did. I, that's one I don't talk about, and it's not in the book. Uh, but, you know, back just before we begin that side of it, um, you know, when you said, what, Chris, what you said, uh, one of the things that became evident, more evident to me, because of that experience was our choices. We have choices, everybody has choices, and that's the consciousness, our, our, our mental capacity as humans, and, and what we have, we all have choices, and, and our, uh, the, our, um, our life is impacted by the choices we make, so, you know, make good choices. But yeah, the uh, the book um, "Hiding in Plain Sight" um, is I, I think it's the only one like it out there with the pictures that I have in there. Uh, so not not to get into the incident that I had that's not in the book, but um, I was in Florida doing a, a speaking presentation last year, 
And while I was last year, I had a goal to do 100,000 push-ups for the year. And I was I was making that goal by doing approximately 2,000 push-ups a week. And I, I mostly did. I thought, okay, if I do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and I do 500 on each of those days, then I'll have good rest time for on Wednesday and the weekends. And and that's the schedule I tried to stick with. I, I had to vary it a couple of times for different things, but I did make 100,000 push-ups in, in the year. And those are pretty well documented on my, on my Instagram account. I kept oh, awesome. good track of those and, and put them out there. But while I was in Florida, and I, I had to do my push-ups that day that I was doing that speech that evening, that presentation. And so I, I, um, you know, like a good Boy Scout, which I wasn't a Boy Scout, but, uh, you know, they always the motto to be prepared. And so I always <laughs> <laughs> I, I always thought, well, you know, people always say they see UFOs or they have a blurry picture or all they can do is draw what they saw or or say or tell about it. And I thought, well, if it's going to happen to me, I know it is. And I'm going to have a camera. And luckily that day, being prepared, I had a camera with me with a, a nice telephoto lens not thinking I was going to see anything. So I start doing my push-ups. I'm on the balcony and I saw this like bright area in the, in the sky way out in the distance, but it still caught my attention. And, you know, I guess maybe because of my connections to the military and the air force and my natural curiosity, I, I saw the bright light in the sky and I, I looked at it like, it goes, what is that? Is it an airplane? And I, I realized, no, it's not moving. It's stationary. It's not a jet, not an airplane. And I thought, well, it must be a helicopter, you know, that's hovering out there. I watched it for a few minutes and I, I just I realized that that's not that it's characteristics. It's not a helicopter. I don't know what it is. So I started taking pictures. I took pictures with my phone. I took videos with my phone. And then I started taking pictures with my uh, my camera and zooming in on my telephoto lens. So I take about 10 or 15 pictures and I, I you know, zoom in on it and it was still a, a small little dot. I couldn't really tell what it was. And I didn't take my camera, didn't take the time to, to look at each picture and zoom in and see if I was getting anything. I just, oh, I'll take some pictures. Then I, said, I did a set of push-ups. I do 50 push-ups. And I went, oh, it's still there. So I take some more pictures. And I do 50 more push-ups. And I oh, it's still there. I took some more pictures. So this went on for, you know, the whole time I did my 500 push-ups. I was well, still there, but I got to get going. I take some more pictures. And I jumped in the shower. I took a shower. And I look back, oh, well, it's, it's still out there. It's moving around a little bit, but it's, it's really weird. Sometimes I can't see it. During that time period, I realized that... I could only see it at certain times with my polarized sunglasses. So when I would look through my sunglasses, and I could see it. I'd lift them up onto my forehead. I couldn't see the object. I put it down. I could see it. My sunglasses, I lift it up. I couldn't see it. But I, was still, but I said, well, I, I don't know if it's going to be picked up by my camera or not. But I continued to take pictures with it. And actually, during that time, it did pick it up a couple of times. So I've got a series of pictures that I I put in the book. So at first, when I went back up well, before the book, so I took all these pictures. And then I said, well, I got to go. The thing's out of sight now. Put my camera away. And I went and did my event. And then about two weeks later, I'm back home. I downloaded them on a laptop. And I started enlarging and zooming in. And when I saw the object, it scared me. Like, I've never seen anything like it. I don't know what it is. It's not a normal aircraft of any type I've ever seen. And it, it, it scared me. So I didn't know what it was. And I didn't. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a gun. And by the way, I should say, it, it, it takes a lot. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's got to take a lot to scare a guy who's falling 3,500 feet out of the Yeah. Like that says, <laughs> that says I'm like, scared you. Yeah. Oh, Lord, man. I bet I, I'd love to see these pictures. I got to, I definitely got, Scott, I got to get the book. I got to get you because I, I, I haven't seen him yet. 
Now I'm just, uh, oh my God, I just go, see any pictures. Go to, like, go to Amazon oh yeah. and just read the reviews and look at the one picture on the cover. And uh, so anyway, so I, I looked at the pictures and I thought I, I said, well, that's what scared me. And I'm thinking it must be a government project. And I don't want to, you know, being my, but I had had a secret clearance and a top secret clearance and a great, you know, my, I feel like I'm a, a citizen, a patriot, uh, uphold the Constitution. You know, we took the same oath to uh, defend the Constitution from all enemies, both yeah. foreign and domestic. And, you know, I think yep. about that still. And so I thought, well, I don't want to just put these pictures out there if it's a, something secret that our government's doing and anybody else can see it. So I, I connected with a military connection and I said, hey, could you have somebody look at these pictures? So they did. They sent them to an analyst, a military analyst. And about three weeks later, I'm like, I'm chopping at the bit. What what they say? What they say? They contacted them and they, and they said, well, they, they said they don't know what it is. Now, this is a military trained animus, analyst. And they said they don't know what it is. And they're going to send the pictures to another government agency that has better capability to analyze these pictures. I don't know. I don't know the analyst and I don't know what agency they sent them to. So I said, OK, great. I want to find out what it is. And if, if it's something super ultra top secret, they can have them and I'll never mention it again, right? You take those uh, agreements that you sign, you don't talk about the things you did. So that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. about three yeah. weeks later, again, I'm like, hey, what'd they say? What'd they say? And I said, well, I haven't, my, my friend said, well, I haven't heard from them. I said, well, hey, call them, ask them. So I think it went by another week or so, they, they, they finally get the word. I said, what did they say? And they said, well, they said it's a weather balloon and an anomaly of your camera. And right then I knew that was BS because it was a brand new camera. I've taken thousands of pictures. <laughs> I take pictures of airplanes that are 30,000 feet high and I can read the insignias on them. I can tell what airplanes it is by whether it's military, civilian. I can see, you know, I can see the company name on the airplane. I said, well, you know, my camera's working good. I took thousands before and thousands after. I took pictures directly at the sun. The sun looks like the sun. Airplanes look like airplanes. There's never been an anomaly. So I said, well, now I know that it's something. So I made a report to a UFO organization. Uh, I actually made it uh, to two different UFO organizations. One, uh, the organization, they published the, that report out there. And I didn't realize that that report was going to be public knowledge and anybody could look at it. And I submitted one picture with it because the, one of the websites said, anything you submit is ours and you no longer have rights to it. And I said, well, I'm not going to submit all my pictures to somebody and they're going to have rights to everything. So I, I, but I did submit one picture. And then I find out that picture has been picked up and that report is all over the internet. One organization out of England that put it on their website, they called it the best, the greatest crypto creature capture ever. They think it's alive. And when you see these pictures, you might even have that thought that it, it might be something that's alive. And so then I started thinking, well, that's pretty crazy, but I never thought about that. But then I think, well, it's this, the air that, that we breathe is another element, just like the water is an element. So what if that, what is above, you know, a um, hundred thousand feet. What's ten miles in space? You know, we we only live in a small ring around this Earth of about you know sea level to three miles up, and we don't know what's really out there. But just like we find creatures that we call alien, you know, that are that are eight miles deep in the ocean, we never go there and we don't live there. What's what's swimming? in space, which is another element that maybe another creature's in. So anyway, when you look at these pictures, you will realize that it is next level technology, whatever it is, whether it's alive or whether it's extraterrestrial technology. And what if, uh, you know, when you think uh, foreign technology and you think other nations, well, what about foreign being extraterrestrial technology? Maybe, maybe it is. 
you know, an anonymous source look at the pictures other than the Air Force and that other person, that other agency. And that's exactly what they told me. And that's one of the, the anonymous, I didn't say their name on there, but they are connected to uh, other events and other agencies. And they said that in their opinion, uh, it is uh, extraterrestrial in nature, the technology, the government may or may not be involved. They didn't know for sure. And um, when you see these pictures, the, the thing is, it goes from the one picture that I submitted uh, online over the course of 100 pictures, and I'm taking pictures every couple of seconds, it changes shape, it changes color, it, it disappears and it reappears. And, you know, you've seen people, uh, you've seen pictures that have been submitted by people, and they might have one picture and then it's blurry and then it's gone. These, this is a sequence of, yes. in, the, in my book, Hiding in Plain Sight, is a sequence of 50 pictures that I put in there. And you can see I, the metadata. I submitted these pictures to a scientific organization uh, in, a, in Huntsville, Alabama. They've had them for several months and they're analyzing them. And I said, hey, I don't have anything to, to hide. I, I'm not uh, making this up. I'm not I'm not a photo editor. I haven't photoshopped anything. These pictures are 100 percent real and you can look at them. And so I sent them original pictures. They can look at it. They've looked at all the metadata. They've reached back to me and asked me a couple of questions, but they haven't uh, come forward with what this what they think it is. Um, but it is uh, <laughs> it, it is really. Uh, and nobody's identified it yet, so it is a, a UFO, an unidentified flying object. And when you see the pictures, you can go to Amazon and just look at the uh, the cover picture and, and, and the reviews on what's been said, and you will see that it is, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. And, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. This is, I'm looking this at it right now. This is the picture you're looking at on the cover. That was about the... Uh, yeah, this is an incredible story. That picture was not. I, I'm looking. At yeah, it changed shape. It went through just like a metamorphosis and came out like that. I was just going to say, and, and by the way, for the audience, the reason we're. Uh, yeah, the reason for the audience, the reason we're kind of stepping on each other, if you hear, is because of the uh, delay. So, you know, we're trying our best here. Um, but I did want to say, this is such a remarkable story. And I actually do a podcast outside of here. I do several um, with narrative.fm, but we do a podcast called Obscurities about these type of encounters. And I, I got to get you on there, man, because this is too amazing of a story. And and you're too reputable of a source. I think with your background in the military, there's a lot of people, I think, who want to be famous and you know, they're just not exactly the most, uh, you know, believing, uh, you know, trustworthy people. Reliable. I completely a good word for it. believe Reliable. you. I don't think you were out trying to. Yeah, exactly. There we go. <laughs> I don't. I don't think you were. Um, you know, trying to to encounter something. I think you were just out that day, and wow, a, a remarkable. Well, and people, and people need to do. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. The cover. I mean, I can see where they would say because it's a metallic. It looks metallic from a reflection standpoint. But it does not look like a balloon <laughs> at all. It looks like, it, honestly, I it, it looks. I don't even know. It's 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 got sharp angles. It's got hard edges. Um, uh, it doesn't look like a plane. It looks like a butterfly to me. That's why I, I, I mean, not a like a giant butterfly that's the size of an that's the size of a jet. <laughs> and it, it's it's yeah, it's amazing. This stuff I pay attention to. I love paranormal. I love the UFOs. I grew up, I, I, I want to see a UFO. I think you're lucky that you did, man. I, this is incredible. Now, Hiding in Plain Sight, if you guys have a chance to check out his book uh, and Scott's book. And and no, he is very reputable um, by any means. I mean, with your experience and then the, the crap that I know about you, good crap, the hard crap. I have it on video. I have it on <laughs> pictures. It, it's there doing its thing up there. And it is uh, something like you have never seen before. Exactly. It will amaze you. 
And we'll skin my skin. You'll have to text this to both of us because I, I really do want to see this. And I'm going to stay in touch with you because I I, I want to check it out. I'm definitely going to stay in touch with you because I would love to get you on the other show that I do, Obscurities, because this is an awesome story. Um, you know, we're going to wrap it up a little bit earlier than we usually do just because of the tech stuff. And I know Chris has other stuff we want to get to. Um, but once again, you could check out the story in Chris's book, The Patriot's Creed, and then the UFO book. You could check out Hiding in Plain Sight. Up on Amazon, scottgearin.com. That's Scott, G-E-A-R-E-N.com, at Scotty Gearin on Instagram, at Scott Gearin on Twitter. Uh, at, at another time when you have a better connection, we got to do a part two to this because this is uh, just amazing. I'd love to. I will um, make my way to a, a better um, internet connection. <laughs> but we'll have this up on Monday. We made it work, man, and, and I think yeah. we're going to love hearing this, that, Scott. And and I, you know, I want some of the vets and, and the young guys to t hear about your service too when you were when you were overseas in Iraq as well. I mean, we we didn't even scratch the surface of your career, so we got we definitely have to have you on again, man, and, and go deeper into that, which I love talking about. But then also, yeah, I, I, I want to know more about the UFOs because I want to see one, and I, I still have it. Damn it, you know. so. <laughs> Uh, we'll get you on again, bro. A lot of times people think UFOs and you think you're going to see a saucer-shaped blinking light thing and it's only going to be at night. But after seeing this object, this UFO, and able to camouflage itself, the bottom was completely blue. And you can see it in the picture. So it could be there in a clear blue sky and you would never see it. It's amazing. And I believe this object, you called it a butterfly, a stingray. I think it can go in any element. It can go in the water. It can go in the air. It can go in space. It can do It can do anything. It could disappear. It may be going in and out of a wormhole. I've got other pictures that look like a, a, a circular contrail and it's gone. It's, it's going to blow you away. I love your book. You know, I was me and wow. Ben were over there. Yeah, wow, brother. I didn't know what was going on with you uh, and Benghazi at the time, but we were over there and and a, and a heartbeat. We would have we would have been right there if we could have. Yeah, you know, I, I I wanted to talk to you about that too because I know you were with a unit that knew what was going on. And um, no, I, I said, I want to get you back on because I, I wanted to go over because that's where I figure out. And I learn a lot of things that were going on with guys in the in, that were in particular units that say, hey, this is what we were doing. This is where we were at. And it really does help. I don't want to say it gives me closure, but it helps me still understand and really know the truth of what was going on around us, which I knew some of the units and I was calling. I was calling some of the units as well. Um but then I find out there was even more units that could have responded. I'm like, holy shit, dude, we really were, for lack of a better term, fucked over <laughs> because we had so many tier one units around the area that were QRF that could have gotten there. And I find out more and more every day. So if you don't mind when you come on again, I would like to talk about that because it, it does help me. And I, I want to know. And I know people want to know as well. Well, if, if we could, if you don't mind that. I don't mind at all. You know, I was not active duty at the time. I, I was uh, right there with Ben and, you know, Morgan and. Uh, yep. And uh, with TC. Yep. Uh, other guys, other Rangers and that were in the mix with us, and mostly Army that I was with, SF and and Marine and, and Rangers in, in our mix. And uh, everybody would have been there in a heartbeat of. If we could have. Thanks, brother. That means a lot. I appreciate it, Scotty. All right, man. Well, I love you guys. Thanks, Scott. Really and, appreciate uh, it. Hey, Dean, any, anytime you, you want to um, you get, uh, talk about this stuff uh, on your other stuff, man, I, I tell you, you just even just read the reviews on this book and read my, what the anonymous person said about it. It's uh, like, whoa. But somebody told me, you know, one hundred percent. I I will be in touch. All right.
All right, man. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Scott. Take care. Lo love you, Scott. Merry Christmas, man. I hope you can edit the heck out of that, man. There was so, I mean, yeah, I, I I mean, for the audience listening, I do want to say, because the audience is probably going to hate me for the fact that he had so much more to get into, but I know for one, you have limited time and then also the delay and everything, but we left them wanting more for sure, because there's so much more to get into. Well, I, yeah, well like we like I said, and I don't know if you were recording at the time or you, you had cut it off, but yeah, he was with Triple Canopy with him and Ben Morgan, my instructor. Oh, yeah, no, that yeah. we captured, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, and and they were over in Iraq hearing about what was going on. And so when, you know, going into that, and, and I, that's how I found out where units were. It's, it, it wasn't that I trusted the government to tell me, oh, yeah, we had a unit here, we had a unit here. Now, I knew within our particular area of operations we were in Libya, I knew where particular units were because that was my job to know. And that was the job as a GRS. All the GRS guys knew this is where our Kirk response guys were because we were so small and we aren't we aren't built for long engagements. That's not what our job is. It's protection, sneak in, sneak out. Don't get in a firefight because we have limited resources, limited ammo, limited uh, limited uh, uh, firearms uh, as far as what we can what we can uh, what we can fight on an equal level. We're because we don't have big guns, um, but. Whenever I talk to guys and you, I still that were there, that were in the area, whether they were in the Mediterranean or in Spain or in the AFRICOM command, and they were actually in either Ethiopia or Somalia or Djibouti, um, you know, is that is Djibouti? Yeah, is that Ethiopia? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I thought, uh, I you know, know it's, or, the, it's the capital of what again? I always I, I, I probably is anyway. But Djibouti. Someone would, is listening, and they're like, "What about your booty? What about my booty?" But Djibouti, <laughs> the, the, and that we had, we actually had a special forces team there as well. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It is it is uh, the official public uh, the Republic of Djibouti on the Horn of Africa, mostly right. French and Arabic speaking. Okay. So it's it's its own. It's again, help me with my my geography. But bottom line is is that. That's how I would continue to find out that there were actually more units available that I didn't even know about, that the government did know, that AFRICOM did know. And and it, it pisses me off because, you know, not only was the, the the conspiracy of a video and a protest went on, but there were there were plenty of units out there. Um, now I know one of one of our one of our, our guests and and he is a veteran and he's a friend and and you know he he yeah they delta couldn't have made it. it was a big story delta couldn't have made it well duh we were talking about delta delta was a unit that could have made it eventually but there were so many other units marine fast companies 10 special forces group the 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 sif team um uh, seal team plus we had an, another marine that was in a mu that was available you know it's just all these other units that were available were the government and some of the other write-ups that we had were well there was just these guys weren't available that's well i got you but these guys were and, yeah. the and i know what you're more. talking about I, I think on some level it has to do with <clears throat> probably guys trying to you know have to get a story out in a certain amount of time yeah we, and case, not, we weren't able to interview you um and but we no, were, I, I think it's important to hear that stuff yeah, and, and by and the way the audience is going to hate me for cutting this one short but it's not <laughs> entirely me we had to <laughs> we had to. so um we'll have him on again and, and i love talking to scotty and if you guys could tell out there scotty is not at any loss for words and he he's very and if really that when he was doing i was following him on instagram that's when i just got back on instagram where he's doing those push-ups dude and he's he's in his 60s he is like 60s and he's still ripped and shredded as as all hell and the reason he has that raspy voice it's because of that injury he sustained on the halo jump which we didn't get into it you can read about it in patriot's creed but when he was going back in to get his to to requalify as a pj he had so much scar tissue on his larynx that it actually was so small he could barely breathe and they had to go in there and clear all that scar tissue out just so he could run because he was running all the PT and that's hard running. And he's doing it with uh, the larynx, the size of a, like a, a pen, you know, it's really it's amazing. Yeah. But the, the voice does sound pretty badass. Sounds, it sounds it a little macho man. Uh, right yeah, it does. That. <laughs> Charles Bronson-esque. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, amazing guy. And, and um, I love his UFO story and that. Yeah. That picture is like, man, it does. It looks like, I guess that was, it looks more like a mantis. It does. It looks like a flying, I can't tell what the hell. Yeah, no, and I mean that 100%. I will get him on one of the other shows that I do and and write up a story about it because it's too remarkable 
uh, of a story. I, I even have Debbie Rashawn doing some of the stories on obscurities, and that, and that's courtesy of Dylan, who helped us out with promoting the last episode. Did an awesome job. So, um, yeah, meeting a lot of great people who are helping us out, and I'm, you know, doing various work. But since you brought up Benghazi, I should also bring up that Michelle Bushman, who is a longtime listener, stuff that I've done, wrote on one of the uh, battle line posts. She brought to my attention this bill, Senate Bill 2054, sponsored by um, Senator Edward Markey, who's actually a Democrat in Massachusetts, um, proposed to posthumously award the Congressional Gold Medal to mm -hmm. Glenn Doherty, Ty Woods, Jay Christopher Stevens, and Sean Smith, and then give the medal to the CIA Agency Museum. Uh, you and I were talking a little bit before we recorded. It seems like it's one of those things that's just been stalled. It's not going anywhere, but I guess... Just wanted to say kudos to uh, Edward Markey for remembering those guys. Well, yeah, and, and I just I don't understand how it could be stalled. I, I just to me it's a no brainer, especially with Roan and being there and seeing what he did, and you know, to to not be awarded some medal of valor to Roan at and, and Bub and Master Stevens and Sean Smith, you know, because they were servicing, they were there serving the country. Uh, and doing it in spectacular fashion. And then when the firefight went on that night with Roan, Roan was our medic. Roan was fighting, and then he'd come and make sure that we were okay. Then he'd get back on the rooftop and continue to fight. And then he would come back and bandage us up or give us what we like. I remember I, after that third attack, I, I my, my arm was screaming, you know, I, because I fell off a wall <laughs> trying to climb into the back of the attic. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the consulate, a wallet crumbled on me, and I... I, of course, I caught myself with my my arm, and I remember him climbing up there on the wall and looking at it, and going, and it was it was bleeding, and it was pretty bad. And he's, uh, you know, not not at it like Oz's that had been basically almost severed off, but it was cut up pretty bad. And I remember he was, I, I'll go down, I'll get you some saline. He ran down the ladder, uh, shimmy down the ladder, got some saline, shimmy back up, and cleaned it off and wrapped it up. And I mean, this dude was doing everything, not just fighting, but he was also taking care of us. And and, you know, even before that, the, and that's what we're, Scotty's saying, it kind of played into what Scotty said, where he gave that medical class, you know, how God works in mysterious ways. He gave that medical class before he burned in so his guys knew what was going on, um, the team he was with. Well, Rowan had just given a medical class to our case officers a couple of days prior if we have to, how to control massive bleeds, you know, before the attack happened. So it's just weird how Rowan was always a step ahead. And even that night, he was always a step ahead and he was going above and beyond. Yes, we all fought. We, I think everybody fought their asses off. Everybody did very, very well fighting. But Roan had another responsibility that he did just as well. Just and that was the medical part where he was taking care of everybody because we had little injuries, this and that, where people were getting just banged up and him taking care of us. So for congressmen's con the Congress to stall on it, you know, eat shit, you guys. There's no reason at all that Roan should not be awarded the gold medal, uh, a congressional gold medal, if not something higher. Same with Bob, who got there and without having any fear for his own safety, climbed up on the rooftop. The only guy from that team that came from Tripoli to get up on the rooftop to help fight with us. And he got right up there and then the mortar started to hit. I mean, fear for your own life and he, he disregarded it because he was willing to sacrifice himself to to get up on the rooftop and help us fight but also the ability to get that plane to us try to get some to help us to us which he saved two more lives because of that action he saved dave ubin and oz's life because those guys were bleeding out their arms and legs were severed so you know I, that's why i really dislike politicians thank you for putting it up there who was the congressman again Andy? yeah uh, uh senator edward Bar senator Senator, Senator Berkey, is it Markey? Markey, Markey. I, I pre, yeah, and hey, and just that's why I, I, I'm in. I'm an independent too, as well, guys. What, what, uh, what is what side? What party? Yeah, he's he's, 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 he's a Democrat. And he's, he's yeah. a Democrat. He's a Democrat. So yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm an independent, guys, because it doesn't make a difference with the party. It's the person. It really is. And and he did the right thing, but to have it stall is is complete horseshit. Uh, you know, I, every senator, every congressman that that is in the office would shit down their leg if they would have been in that same position that and Roan and Bub didn't at all and Ambassador Stevens deserves it um he, he Sean and, Smith he, he, and Sean Smith definitely deserves it they all do because they were there serving their country and we were all made to eat a shit sandwich and and four of four of the guys died eating that shit sandwich that you gave us guys so um 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy and I'm honored. And I, I think they should get it. Definitely should get it. There should be no question. It should not stall. Pass that through. And honestly, that's a good lead into what's going on. Yes, with exactly. Yeah. I know that you wanted to mention. I, we don't have video right now, but I'm holding it up. Another guy who was mentioned in the Patreon yeah, yeah. feed, uh, Sergeant Alan Cash, who, Alan, um, yeah. as, as you said, kind of making the rounds on social media now, yet you were talking about it a year and a half ago, yeah. that this guy should get the next Medal of Honor, and it looks likely to happen. Yeah, and that's amazing. You know, I, I really, you know, Sergeant First Class Cash, we, we were able to interview um, for the Patriots Creed, his mom, and then also his CO, his captain that was there with him. And he, we, we wrote about him in the Patriots Creed. And I say we because, guys, I do have somebody that helped Melissa Moore. She's tremendous. She helps me write these books because I'm a dumb ranger and <laughs> I need all the help I can get. But, um, right. I mean, writing, people don't realize writing a book is hard. I write articles <clears throat> here and there. I don't know if I could write an entire book. It, it makes it's, it captivating. It, it's tough, man. And, and I'm very blessed to have her and then a bunch of editors that help us at Hachette. So I, you know, I'm very blessed with that aspect because it is, it's not easy. Um, but I want to, for just a little bit of his backstory, he was in Iraq is he was a Bradley commander, Bradley platoon sergeant and, uh, running a Bradley team. They were hit, uh, in a small arms fire, an RPG and, and an IED and it disabled their, his track It disabled his Bradley. And he actually got out of the Bradley safe unscathed, but the Bradley caught fire because at that time they were made and, and the fuel lines were in the wrong spots, man. So the Bradley caught fire. And his team, if you don't know what a Bradley is, you have infantry dismounts that ride in the Bradley in the bottom mm -hmm. of it. And they were in there and they were trapped and they basically were getting cooked, burned alive. And because of the fuel lines, it severed. So he got out unscathed, but his BDUs were all covered, or DCUs, whatever they were wearing at that time. His, his uniform was covered in diesel fuel. It's covered in gas and fuel. So when he ran back in there to get them out, his shit caught fire. And his suit did, and he did multiple times to get them out. So those guys were going to die. He was unscathed, got out alive. He went back covered in diesel fuel, got all his team out. All those guys survived, but he ended up dying because of his burns. I mean, to yeah, me, that's like 2005, really yeah, the height of everything. It was in Amrag. It was pretty, I was there in 2005 with the contracting company and uh, on and off and on for the next six years. And it was pretty, it was pretty hot there. Uh, literally and figuratively, but um, to to when I read that story and heard about him, I heard about was it a year and a half ago? I think it's what we finally decided is when the book. Yeah, came yeah, out. we were talking about but that before. We yeah. started writing the book, you know, two years earlier, or the, six months earlier than that. Um, and I heard this story. I'm like, how can we not put this guy in the book? And then I was like, how does this guy not have the Medal of Honor? Oh my God, that that epitomizes honor right there. That epitomizes courage and 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 self of service. Every army value that you have, his actions represent all of it. I mean, the book could have just been about him. Period. And, could have been um, about any of these guys. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah you know, it, Izzy, yeah. Izzy Motto, Scotty Guerin, Rob Jabber, another guy, just tremendous guys. Which we'll get Robin. Hopefully, we'll get Izzy on the show as well. Um, but you know. I, I was like, this This is such a dis injustice to for this guy not to have the Medal of Honor. And so we put him in the book. And, of course, I love the story. It epitomizes personal courage and epitomizes self-service and honor. But also, you know, in the book, we I put a little section there if, to a petition for giving Iwan Sergeant First Class Cash and getting him the Medal of Honor posthumously. And um, and we were able to get it in there. And it's good to see that, that it looks like it's going to go forward and go through. And um, do we know when do we have? No, I, you know, I, but he, who knows again with Congress, it, it's there's do no you think way. it would be during this administration though? I mean, cause we only got a month and then I, I honestly, I, I would like to see that, but I seriously doubt it because of all the other stuff that people think are yeah. more important Um, in Congress and senators think they're more important to very well. So, uh, and another injustice that for a service member that deserves better, that that hopefully will get what what he rightfully deserves his family rightfully deserves and that is the highest award you can get in the united states military and that's the medal of honor and um yeah i i i, I mean I, that's why i don't like being called a hero or anything like that to me that's that's a hero that yeah. is, and i guess i could bring it up i mean just to, you know not to take shots at anybody but i remember you know you and i were just saying uh it shouldn't have anything to do with the fact that this guy is black it, it it's yeah. who he is as an individual and the fact that people are using it to make some type of political statement 
It's it's stupid. It, that, it's that, about yeah, as an individual, and and, but, and just the guys that we have on this show. You know, I don't have, I don't bring, you know, not his real name, but James Powell on the show because he's a black guy who happened to be a CIA contractor. He's or a uh, or in CIA, you know, former Marine. He's just a remarkable and great dude. I tried. What well, is the last thing on my mind? And that's why the the timing of it and everything. If it's a political statement, because because uh, Sergeant First Class Cash was was black, then. He still deserves it. I don't. I, I didn't write about it because of that yeah. when I wrote it a year. Yeah, you weren't ago. like I need to fill a quota. No, <laughs> you know? it's like I'm like and and um, you know. But whether that's the reason or not, if it is, hey, you guys know, and you people, the senators and congressmen, are doing it because you're you're trying to make a political statement, or now people are recognizing it because of the climate right now of what's going on with the BLM. You know, again, another thing, eat shit, guys. It, that makes no difference. He was a soldier. He was a platoon sergeant, sergeant first class, which is about as hard as you can get in the enlisted rank. I mean, being not hard to get there, well, it is hard to get there, but you're a hard motherfucker <laughs> if you're a platoon sergeant. Yeah. So he earned his stripes getting there. But what he did, I didn't, I didn't see, I, didn't, I still don't see color. I saw a soldier. I saw a soldier that epitomized the army values and epitomized honor and like I said, when we put it in the Patriots Creed over a year and a half ago, of course, the climate was completely different. So there was no ulterior motives. And 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 if people did have ulterior motives, they do right now to get to him. Well, still get it to him because he deserves it. And then shame on you for having an ulterior motive uh, to make a political statement on a soldier's immense sacrifice and his service up to that point which was outstanding per his company commander who we who we interviewed and who spoke so highly of him um and it's in the book we talk about how how his career was you know how how great he was of just a soldier up into that point and then of course exceeded even those standards that that faithful day where he lost his life um you know how incredibly it was it race doesn't mean shit and that's why i always tell people what well, yeah this or that you know i'm i'm hispanic you know, so nobody I work with the span. I don't see that. Yeah, I see a guy right and left of me. Well, we we see brothers. We see soldiers. We see rangers. We see seals. We see teammates. We don't see, we don't see ethnicity or gender or we don't we don't ethnicity, gender, religion. I I've fought alongside Muslims. He wasn't Muslim when the bullets were flying. He was just the guy next to me that we're keeping yeah. each other alive, and he was my brother. And so, you know, that's why with this United States, how we are nowadays, you guys got to get over that political correctness and, and all that other shit that you use to sell, sell stuff and, and, and make money on. Uh, it's, it's about just the person itself. So, yeah, uh, that, that's well said, man. And now knowing his story, I'll take, um, you know, uh, some greater happiness when I see it happen. And yeah. I, when you see him and his family being recognized, that's going to be awesome. And his mother is so awesome. I talked to her, I've talked to her on the phone a few times and she is just a wonderful, just a wonderful lady, man. Just a, she's, a, she's like a grandma. She, you want her at the house taking care of you on Thanksgiving. I mean, it's that just the sweetest lady in the world. So she deserves it too. Yeah. And I know she's been pushing for it as well. Um, yeah. And she shouldn't have to. It should yeah. just happen. She just happened. And, it looks like it will. So I'm um, glad to see that. The next show with Chris is going to be in a few weeks since you'll be away. So what I decided is that we're going to make that first show back uh, guest free because we haven't done that in a oh, while. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we'll do some giveaways. I have some extra books from some great authors who have been on. We'll do some giveaways for the best questions. So you guys have until January 8th, which is when Chris will be back to submit your questions for either of us to uh, battlelinepodcast at gmail.com. Any questions at all? Anything related to your books, Benghazi, um, the podcast, I mean, uh, weapons, anything. Well, yeah, we, and we, we're going to get some talk about, because get the ATF on their ruling on that new brace. I, I've, I keep getting emails from my gun guys. What do you think about this, where the ATF is doing a ruling? Or we can submit comments for the, the PDW, the PD, uh, personal defense weapon brace, which makes the AR classifies it as a pistol or rifle. Okay. That's good questions to have. And honestly, I, I implore people to go to their ATF site, especially all you 2A guys, since if you've read the read the write up that the ATF presented is so ambiguous and so <laughs> there's so many vaguenesses that they basically what it's doing it's allowing them to to change to change their standards of what they would classify as a pistol brace which will help which like my Tonos toolbox that is considered a PD PDX or PDW and that could affect 
the making of my own guns, my, the toolbox. So leaving it vague out there, you're giving the ATF, you're giving the ATF and the government the ability to, to change standards so they can basically make everything illegal if they want to. So go to the comments, go to the ATF's website, put your comments in of what you believe a PDW, a personal defense weapon should be, or in what a short barrel rifle should be, what the differences are. Tell them, because basically they're in their write-up, they've just said, well, we might do it this politely. Way. Yeah, do, 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 yes, do it. Nothing. It's like do threatening. It. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't say F you, you know, uh, just yeah. go if you don't do this, I'll come to your building with an <laughs> AR. No. Yeah, that probably won't help me. But it, yeah, it really, they did. I, I read it and like, well, that, kind of a wishy-washy way of saying it. But then you look and like, man, they're being very vague just for the simple fact that now they can change it if they want to. Uh, or at least politicians the ability to change it if they want to, or all the all the supporters of Biden that say, yeah, you can shoot a guy in a kneecap, but it's just this stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Do you really want somebody that thinks that you can shoot somebody in a kneecap under duress, uh, deciding on what a weapon should be, a type should be? No, you don't. So go put your go put your two cents in, guys, and and I will as well, and hold the ATF accountable so we get some we, we get some standards. This is what it's supposed to be. Okay, we got it. Not that, well, this is what's supposed to be if this happens, but if this is where it needs to be, then this is what it's supposed to be. Because all we're doing is leaving ourselves open for a complete, a complete. And we had a, who's our guest last week? Um, oh, help me <laughs> out. Oh, oh, you're talking Jeff DePotsy. Uh, DePotsy, where you leave ourselves up like with Canada, where they can just ban all ARs. And that is essentially. Well, or here in, here in New York, they did too. I mean, right after Sandy Hook, the ARs were gone. So. I mean, and, and it sold a lot of them right before that happened because it was just people waiting in line, right? Waiting in line, yeah. You can't anymore. It's a, so this is this is something where we don't get. I don't get political. I don't think this is political. It's just hey, this is something where your voice should be heard. This is where. No, and I get, and, and I mean, the show has always been pro Second Amendment, pro or pro know. Constitution. It's, it's yeah, Second Amendment, say, that, yeah, pro that's First it. Amendment, pro Second Amendment, all of it. So. De definitely, definitely. And, and, so exercise your First Amendment rights to support the Second Amendment. Um, yes. but just, just do it in a respectful, respectful way. way. And if you don't <laughs> want to, and you want to go on there, still put your comment, but tell them why, you know? I, I, yeah. So yeah, that's all I know. I'm, I'm going over. I just want to get that in there. Sorry, brother. No, I, I agree. I think it's important. So, uh, and, and for us though, just to go back battle line podcast at gmail.com, you guys have till January 8th to submit your questions and I will do a really awesome giveaway like we did last time. Um, and send you guys out some books. If, for the best questions. I don't have an unlimited supply or anything, but the best questions. We'll send you guys some books of authors who have been on the show. Um, oh, you know, you know what we could do, too? Because I, I, I just did this on the Tonos Gear Locker. Um, magazines. I got uh, people were – there's basically a magazine shortage going on now for okay. air, and I was able to grab a ton of them. And could you send them to every state? I know that when I worked previously with uh, – you know, my last company, we couldn't send um, like armor to Connecticut. It's some weird law. I, with with magazines itself, and since they're they have battle line or KPI on there, or the a lion head logo that I have, I think you can because they're just plastic. They're not steel. They're but that's a good. I, I'm pretty sure you can send magazines pretty much everywhere. But I think there are some special rules to New York and California. The, the okay. states that are pretty hard. On their uh, on their because the lines. the armor thing strangely enough it was only Connecticut weird uh, I wonder yeah. uh, well I, I I don't think there is to be honest with you I, but I could be wrong I, but I'm fairly certain you can send them well now email. people are going to want that if they submit emails that's cool well I'll, I'll, I'll for the best <laughs> one we'll we'll get you we'll get you one of the you know if you, you don't want to, one gets so, gets a uh, a battle mag. a battle line mag or you, your choice fourteenth hour KPI the line head logo which is my line head logo that I designed on an airplane when I needed a logo four years ago, <laughs> but there is meaning behind it. And you can go on my website, chrisconnorperano.com and read the meaning behind the logo. Cause there is a reason why I have all the symbols in there or a battle line one. And um, no, we, we're, I know Christmas coming on. So wait till after Christmas guys. And, but if you want to pre-order any there, they're on my website as well, but we'll, yeah, we'll donate one for best question as well, along with a book. Cool. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's what we'll do. I'll do a few books for other questions and the best question gets that. So submit them. 
Uh, wrapping things up here, Fort Scout Munitions is a manufacturer of multi-federal patented solid copper and brass CNC spun ammunition. It's designed to tumble upon impact in soft tissue, leaving devastating wound channels for faster bleed out and quicker incapacitation. It was originally developed to innovate and improve on the standard of military grade ammunition design and was found that not only did the TUI ammunition outperform competitors in the self-defense industry, but it quickly became apparent that it would be a top contender for hunters as well. With the ammo being CNC spun, the tolerances are some of the tightest on the market, ensuring that you receive the same results with each pull of the trigger. Fort Scott Munitions is available throughout privately owned businesses in all 50 states, as well as direct online through fortscottmunitions.com. Once again, F-O-R-T-S-C-O-T-T-M-U-N-I-T-I-O-N-S.com. Use our promo code BATTLELINE and you're going to get 15% off your order other than subscription orders. Only available to listeners of this podcast. Go there now. Fort Scott Munitions is a proud supporter of Chris Peranto, BATTLELINE Tactical, and the BATTLELINE Podcast. Um, if I don't see you or hear from you, because I know you're going to be doing your thing uh, before January 8th, I hope you have a great trip, man, and enjoy Thanks, time bro. with the family. Thanks, bro. And uh, Yeah, dude, no, because I know you know how we say the switch is on with the show for you and i'm the same way too at, at a certain point it's like the switch is off switch is off <laughs> yeah. with your family. and you don't want to think about even this podcast but yeah no, switch is off for a while guys uh but merry christmas to everybody out there god bless you all um i hope you have a wonderful wonderful christmas stay positive you got ian you're gonna but you got it next week right you yes got, next got, week we have i believe it should be will chiarucci who does a sports podcast i'm awesome. meaning to get him on um, on the board sports kind of talk about how sports is handling everything going on and uh it's good and he's great and then, so, and then, you know rich i know you want to have them on i know more. that sucks I, I really am jealous yeah but we'll get them on again along with like scott we'll get scotty on again in fact that he's texting me right now which i like yeah we're gonna get you on again Rex. So yeah for the audience i hope you enjoyed that i really did but um i feel like we only scratched the surface yep and uh, but Ian next week got his quiet storm, very white voice, you know, that, that, <laughs> that makes you feel all warm and sexy inside. And and um, <laughs> it's a podcast still going to keep going. And we appreciate you guys helping us get through another year, which I, I think was pretty successful and it was fun. So to me, that's success. We very successful and our sponsors as well that we've had this year, uh, especially, you know, Fort Scott and, and Ned and, that have been with us throughout the year. And hopefully we'll be with us. I believe Ned will be with us next year. Um, and I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm sure Scott. Fort Scott. So. Fort Scott was yeah. well. If not, you know, pretty consistently, um, all of them. And and yeah, you guys have a very merry Christmas, as Chris said. Uh, and yeah, do whatever you got to do to enjoy this with your family and friends. And you know, and keep keep staying positive. Same exact thing you did. Hey, Amen, brother. Take care, everyone. That's all for this episode of the Battle Line Podcast, but we'll be back on Monday with more American Straight Talk. Until then, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Battle Line Podcast and on Twitter at Battle Line Pod. To sign up for future Battle Line tactical courses, go to www.christantoperanto.net. Believe in yourself, face all challenges head on, and as always, never quit.